movie fans to another episode of Halloween Victories, where the scariest part is watching the movies. I am your host, Matt Presents, joined as always by my spooky co-host. Uh, hello, I am, uh, The Mummy. I, I had an idea for a Dracula name, but then I was like, wait, match Dracula. I need to be the mummy. So, okay. You know, they can't all be winners. I'm the mummy. You, you could have been Mummy Mackle. Mummy Mackle? All right, yeah. fine. I'm, I'm, I'm Mommy Mackle. I'm the, the <laughs> wife of Daddy Derek. That works. <laughs> Saved it. Daddy Derek's wife is Mama Cat. Come no, on. he's not faithful. You think that man's faithful? <laughs> You have a lot of things coming I, to you. I don't think that man is married. Because he is not. Not in the real world. In Cool Cat he is, but not in the real world. I mean, it's basically a missed opportunity for every single woman on the planet. <laughs> um, anyways, to get away from Cool Cat for a second, <laughs> today we're going to talk about both first entries in the Dark Universe. <laughs> it's Dracula Untold versus The Mummy 2017. Now, I, I think I was a, a little off when I was talking about this last episode, because I didn't actually know Dracula Untold was supposed to be a part of the Dark Universe specifically. Near the end of... Because Dr Dracula Untold was already in production. But near the end of production, they were working on an idea for the Dark Universe, and they're like oh, we'll shoot a scene for the end of Dracula Untold and make Dracula Untold the first movie in the series. Which is what Marvel did with, like, Iron Man and the Hulk. So it kind of made sense. More sense than The Mummy. But uh, then Dracula Untold underperformed and they're like, nope, that one's not Dark Universe. Mm -mm. Um, I guess I'll introduce it since I kind of already am talking about it. Dracula <laughs> Untold is a movie from 2014 uh, about Vlad Dracula, uh, more commonly known as Vlad the Impaler, king, king of Transylvania, or Count of Transylvania, wh whatever. Whatever he is. He's in charge of Transylvania. Uh, and the, the Turks are coming. The Turks are planning this invasion. So he tracks down this, like, ancient mythical power uh to to like protect his people and that's how he becomes a vampire um now a lot of people it, it's it's interesting to me that this is about vlad the impaler and not like the fictional count dracula because by all accounts the only thing bram stoker took from vlad the impaler was the name dracula which means son of the dragon, or son of the devil, depending on who you ask. Both names get brought up in this movie. Um, what'd you think, Michael? Uh, far from the worst thing we've watched on the show. Uh, pretty... I don't know, I, can, I guess I could see why some people enjoy this one. It's, it's probably more on the negative side of feedback from other people, but I, you know, I, I looked into reviews, they're... There's some fans of this one. I guess that uh, for like a monster movie like this, there can be something kind of endearing about the main character, like intentionally seeking out this curse as like a as a way to protect people rather than just it's something that happened like wrong place, wrong time sort of scenario. There was like maybe a couple scenes in this movie that I actually kind of enjoyed, but uh, most no, of it, I agree. most of it was something that you've seen somewhere else or just kind of not super well made. Like it's not yeah, a, it's, in, it's in a, the movie 300. I've seen it before yeah. in the movie 300. <laughs> it, it's like fairly competent at points, but I also do think that like from a production standpoint, one the way I described it when we were watching it is I feel like some of the shots are like a little too busy. Like they, I, yeah. I don't know if it's just, um, they had some I, cool ideas there, but they didn't necessarily always know how to go about approaching those ideas. Like, there's a lot of scenes where bats are just flooding the screen, and the camera's moving like crazy, and it's just like, I feel like that's a pretty cheap way to achieve action, because it's like, 
I, I, it's like you don't really have to work that hard when you do that. It's kind of like, oh, the it, it's just fr- the shot's really frantic, so you can't really tell what's going on. But that's because it's such a crazy scene. And it's like I've seen stuff like that done well before, like intentional sloppiness, like successfully adding to a to a fight scene or to a horror scene. Uh, it just it, in this movie, I don't think it worked very well, though. It felt kind of like a disguise almost. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, to hide imperfections with like CGI and whatnot, but definitely a couple. Of, there's definitely moments in this movie where I was like, okay, these there's people working on this that know what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I joke about three hundred, but also it it feels like it just like every fantasy epic from like the past decade because it also has a lot of lord of the rings influence like, yeah clearly they were trying to go for like a lord of the rings visual style and maybe even like like a little bit of game of thrones was game of thrones running by the time this yeah, yeah, yeah game of thrones was 2011 yeah so yeah that, that, this that would have been out so yeah i feel like they're pulling from like so many other fantasy epics with the visual style here and like, it's not as good as any of them. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like, uh, it's even story wise. I don't really know what the story of Dracula is that well. Obviously I know the character he's, everyone knows the character Dracula, but I never really read the book or watched a lot of the movies. Uh, like unlike the mummy where I've seen the Brendan Fraser one, I haven't seen a lot of stuff for this character in the past. So I don't know how relevant this film story is to it, but I feel like there's a smaller scale to take this story. It doesn't have to be a kingdom in a big war. It could be more like a guy just trying to protect his family or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I that's know. the weird thing. It doesn't feel like a Dracula movie at all. And it, like, on the one hand, I could see an argument for like, oh, this is like such a different take on Dracula, but it's not an interesting take on Dracula. Like you compare this to uh, Martin Scorsese's Dracula from the 90s. Uh, it was Scorsese, right? Fuck. Uh, with Gary Oldman. That's like a pretty different telling of Dracula, but it's still... Mm. It, a, it's still a horror movie. It still has Dracula as this like, evil seducer and i don't even mind you doing like a dracula backstory where he starts off with like good intentions uh although there's not really a point in this movie where he becomes like evil yeah really like he because they're he trying to a- do an mcu they want to make him likable for a, not a, a second movie you know <laughs> but see like This is getting into comparisons already. The Mummy didn't do that. The Mummy had a villain. Mm -hmm. But, I I mean, like you said, there there are some cool scenes in this movie. They are broken up by a bunch of really dull, not good scenes. But there's, like, moments, especially when he's in that cave, talking to, like, the the original vampire, I guess. That's my favorite scene. Yeah, no, that's, like, a cool scene. It's well written. Because there is, like... Some shitty, you called it out when we were watching, some shitty dialogue at the beginning when he's talking to his family. Oh, and you're, like, yeah. thinking, like, this is what the whole thing's going to be. But then, no, you get that Dracula scene where he's talking to the original Dracula. And it's like, yeah, this is actually, like, kind of an intriguing way to write this. Yeah. that Like, there there are some cool scenes in this movie. Not a lot, like, two or three. But, like, I don't know. I, I it's It's not a complete washout. Uh, they, they did do some good stuff in this movie. Just... For sure. Most of it's pretty boring. I, I guess, like, what I would find more interesting, and this is kind of going off what we were talking about just a moment ago, is, like, I don't know, focus on the psychological side of it if you want to do this, like, especially if you want, you know, instead of him being, like, a monster people are fighting, if you want the monster to be the main character... Uh, maybe make it so like, yeah, he really needs these powers to get himself out of situation like they do. It doesn't have to be a war. It could be something more personal to him. Um, just because, I, again, I think that, yeah, I think you're right. It's like bl- blending two things together that don't need to be blended. Uh, and I feel like if you're going to do this big war and you have this plan for a cinematic universe, maybe the war is better saved off for a later movie. <laughs> uh I don't know, though. Um, but like I said, I don't have a lot of context for this, like character and like if like this is any of that's relevant to the original story at all but um if you just made it about a guy who like okay it's going to help you get out of the situation but it might also turn you into a irredeemable monster in the process 
and him making that decision and just the paranoia after making that decision, like trying to avoid the temptation of, you know, drinking blood or yeah, any of that no, stuff I mean, or just the power it gives you, you know, I think there could be a cool, I'm sure there are movies that have done that, honestly. No, there, 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 there are plenty of like vampire movies where they like, they, 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 they get new fan. There's a new vampire and they struggle with like, this power and like the, the temptation to use it and like whether or not they should use it. Um, I'm trying to think of one offhand. Near Dark is kind of like that. I like Near Dark. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm totally down for like a Dracula origin story where he starts off as like a good guy, but then like the, the being a vampire like drives him to this villainous point but, like, at, at the end of the movie, because th there's a scene at the end of the movie that takes place in the modern day, and it's like, okay, this is the part they shot to tie this into the, the <laughs> dark universe. Like, it's really obvious which scene they went back and shot to yeah. tie it into the dark universe. Right. But, like, even by that scene, he still seems like a nice dude, and it's like, that's not Dracula. That's not even Vlad the Impaler. Like, Vlad the Impaler was a bad dude. <laughs> yeah. I feel like uh, if you wanted to, like, I guess within a cinematic universe, the best approach with the first movie is, you know, I know that Iron Man had Nick Fury at the end. I know that, that but that's what they did. What you could do is just make the first movie stand out, make a couple of movies, and then have, like... At first, you can do something as simple as just details in the background, like small things, and then as you actually get closer to the crossover stuff, start to build on that, start to have those scenes. You don't really need to do that in the first movie. I feel like a lot of people feel obligated to, because that's what Marvel did. Uh, see if the first movie sells well first. Um, and then you start to throw did. scenes like that. Yeah, right? So now, even for people who enjoy those movies, this affects fucking The Mummy a I mean, lot more. Uh, but yeah. people who enjoy these movies have this nonsense in there. That's, I mean, that's the thing. I've seen Dracula Untold before, and I did not know it was supposed to be part of the Dark Universe until after I had seen it. Yeah. <laughs> I Honestly, if you're gonna do, like, a backstory movie that ends with the character, like, y you know, if you want to, like, do a backstory movie that builds into this bigger universe with Dracula, I think you do, like, a Van Helsing backstory, right? Because Van Helsing is the hero of that story. Van Helsing is, is... probably should be, like, your central protagonist of the Dark Universe. Uh, but across both movies in it, he does not appear, so... <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a missed opportunity, I think. Granted, yeah. there, there is a, a, a movie dedicated to Van Helsing that I have not seen. I've heard mostly negative things about it. That might be, like, the interesting third movie to throw in, like, with these <laughs> two. Yeah. Um, 2004, Hugh Jackman. Um, I, I'm familiar. I've never seen it. I've never seen it either. Yeah. Maybe, a, maybe it's its own pair up one day. Maybe next Halloween. Who knows? Perhaps. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have anything else to say about, like, the movie in, in general. Would you like to talk yeah. about more specific stuff? Yeah, um... I was trying to think if there was, like, another scene that I liked that would be, like, worth bringing up. But, um, a lot of the scenes, it's just, like, little shots that I like, or little moments where I'm like, oh, that's that was a good shot, oh, that was a good shot. Because that definitely hap that happens consistently enough in the movie, the cinematography is pretty good. I'm not yeah. into like the color scheme. I think it kind of, I don't like the the it. It doesn't look good color wise. You know what? I I like the act structure in the movie. Um, just because it's like, it feels like it's getting to the point pretty quickly, and I appreciate that. It's not like dragging on anything too long. I feel like the first thirty minutes are you know setting up the war, setting up like. The Dracula myth, you do see Dracula in a scene before, you know, the second act. Um, it's just a big setup. Act two, he gets the Dracula powers and he's like a badass in battle. And then in act three, him being, um, you know, his, his ability. I keep saying he turns into Dracula. It's not he turns into a vampire. Uh, and in the third act, everybody knows now. 
it's like the secret has been revealed and that leads to complication that, you know, makes things more complicated. So I like, I kind of can appreciate that. It's like not holding on to things too long. It's not like, Oh, the reveal has to happen at the very end of the movie. They're able to actually like have scenes of like the characters turn on him, but then getting used to this and then accepting it that they have to go this route. Um, Still, there's, you know, just because they got I, the basics down doesn't mean, like, the details in between are fun. Yeah, but uh, the problem I have is, like, I, th- like, the whole war with the Turks story doesn't really make, because there's, like, a battle in the second act, but then, the like, the war hasn't even started yet. Yeah. And so then you gotta wait for the third act for the actual war, but it's like, why the fuck is there a battle in the middle of the second act? And, like, sure, they explain it, but it, it in some long-winded exposition scene that I was not paying attention to, but, like, it just seems like they wanted to throw a battle into the second act and they did not have a very good justification for it. Yeah, I, I, I think all of the... Sorry, go ahead. Well, but they wanted to save the big fight for the end of the movie, but it's like, okay, but we also want to show off his powers now, so here's this little battle. Right. I think that, like, all of the world building stuff, like, all the stuff involved in the war, all of that's nonsense. That's why these two didn't need to be, these two ideas didn't need to be combined with one another. Um, Because it's just, like, I already have a problem with fantasy movies, and I know that there's, like, definitely exceptions, but, like, I feel like a lot of them just try to throw way too much shit at you in a short period of time. That's why Game of Thrones is, like, a really... It's great that it's a TV show and not a movie. Um, Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I just think... I I feel like a lot... Like, that's my biggest issue with the fantasy genre. Video games and TV shows can give it the time it needs. Books can give it the time it needs. Movies... I don't think that happens too often. Even Lord of the Rings had to do like multiple movies, you know? Um, so I think it's like when you have like all this history and this big war, I don't know. I just an hour and 30 minutes plus a whole other aspect you're trying to focus on with like the vampires. It doesn't, you can't focus on both of those and make it all like cohesive, you know? Yeah. But what I like about the three act structures, I feel like the main character's journey is kind of realized in those three acts and ends in a stupid way. But there's at least some, like, decent plot progression. Or the main character, at least. Um, that's about it in terms of broad speaking. If you wanted to talk about, like, I don't know, like, effects I mean, or casting. Like, we're talking about, like, fantasy and the fantasy politics. But, like, we are still talking about Vlad the Impaler, a real person who lived and who actually fought the Turks. Mm. <laughs> and it's like... Yet this is a real thing that happened. Uh huh. Why is it so confusing? <laughs> like you didn't like like you didn't even have to make up complicated lore. The lore already exists. Yeah. In real life. I I just don't I I don't expect them to do that at all. <laughs> no, no. I, You're right. They probably should. They probably should. But in fairness, it is like historical fantasy because he does become a vampire. <laughs> yeah. I heard that, like, I've heard people say, like, mention people doing that in a more fun way. Like, there's a movie, isn't there a zombie movie about Abraham Lincoln? Well, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, yeah. Oh, Vampire Hunter, uh, okay. Here's the funny thing about Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, is, like, the book was, like, written by this huge, like, Abraham Lincoln buff, and there's, like, a lot of weird little things we don't know about Lincoln's life like every now and then there's just like blanks that that no one has answers to so the book basically goes yeah every time we don't know something about Lincoln's life uh vampires it was vampires, vampires <laughs> did. yeah like that that's that that's kind of fun that shows kind of a good sense of humor with this and I don't know about I, the movie but for like the book it's just like I haven't seen the movie. I have seen the Asylum's ripoff, Abraham Lincoln vs. Zombies. That might be what I was talking about. <laughs> uh, it was not very good. Okay. Although, <laughs> shit, I think uh, John from Homeless Movies was talking about like his girlfriend was in the movie, like as an extra. <laughs> I It might not be John, it might have been someone else, but I think it was John from Homeless Movies who was talking about... Uh, his, his girlfriend was an extra in that movie, so. 
no, right it's, on. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but uh, I think that you can mix like fiction and something that actually happened. I, oh, yeah. I, with, with, within enough time. Don't do that with 9-11 or anything right now. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, God. What's that fucking Robert Pattinson movie? Where, like, the twist ending is that it takes place on 9-11? I have no idea what you're talking about. Twilight? <laughs> yeah, yes, Twilight. It was Twilight. I'll figure it out. But, uh... I could probably just the, look up uh, Robert the, Patterson 9-11. <laughs> should we talk about the cast of this movie? Um... Because... Yeah. Not a, not a lot of big names. You do have Luke Evans as, uh, Vlad... Vlad the Impaler. And he's fine. I mean, you know, it's for what it is. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly seen him do better, but he was he's fine. He's fine. Char- Charles Dance as Master... He's just labeled as Master Vampire. Uh, he's... I think he's the best part in the movie. Uh, very short part. Oh, yeah. And then everyone else is super bored and super forgettable. <laughs> Sorry, but like... Name one other character that even remotely stood out in this movie. <laughs> Maybe the villain. I he didn't stand out to me. I I kept forgetting that he was there. Honestly, if, if <laughs> okay, so like there's a big climactic battle on like a pile of silver coins, and I'm like, okay, who is he fighting in this scene? Have we seen them before? Because I'm sure we have, but like they they are not established enough as a villain like you get to the climax and you're like i know nothing about this character like i know i know he wants to take over transylvania that's it that's all i know about him yeah uh it's it's lame uh, okay one more actor uh who did make an leave an impression on me and that's paul k as brother lucian because he's the one who like uh basically reveals uh that you know the one guy turned and uh, he's the vampire like he's be- begging him to like just turn over, come into the light before it's too late. Let me do, let me do this. To, <laughs> let me kill you, basically. And he takes his son at the end. <laughs> yeah, uh, that guy's performance left an impression on me. He, he was he was go, he was going kooky with it. Dominique Cooper is an actor. He, who was he was actually in the MCU. He was Howard Stark in Captain America. Um. <laughs> so that's that's the crossover between. This and the, the the MCU. He was also an Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, the, we have Art Parkinson and Sarah G- Gaden or Godon. Yeah. Godon. Uh, both of that. Uh, they have a trope that I really hate that's in like all of these movies where it's just it's the wife and child that you love because they're the wife and the child. There is nothing <laughs> notable about their personalities. They are as a blank slate as you can possibly get, but you're just supposed to care about them because you can relate to that, right? Having a kid and a uh, uh, wife, you can at least relate to your parents having that. Yeah. Don't you love your wife? Don't you love your child? When you become a vampire, but free, free your family. Yeah, it, it's like I don't know. I it's they do nothing. The wife and the yeah. son do nothing. They they're are like, so fucking boring. <laughs> it's like so. It's such a common thing, though. Like it's like there are hun- like there's probably hundreds of movies released every single year like that. Yeah. I mean, uh, the son is the the kid who voiced Kubo and Kubo and the Two Strings. Yeah, no diss to uh, the performances. The movie gave them nothing to work with. Like, oh I, yeah, no, that's that's the thing here is like we're like, oh, all of these performances were underwhelming, but it's because they have nothing to do. Yeah, like I'm looking for this entire list, and it's like this could have been anyone. <laughs> like, there's like, like maybe. Two, the wife, there's like three super significant deaths in the movie. The wife is the third one, and that's the only one that you can remember because it's like, okay, yeah, it's his wife. You're going to remember that. But then there's two other people who die who were clearly like built up as like good friends of the main character, but you don't know them. The film treats you like you knew them, but you don't know them at all. You're like, me, me and Chris were like saying, oh no, I'm really going to miss this guy. Don't kill this guy off. 
I mean, you don't really know the wife either. She's just yeah, you don't. It's just because you know it's like the significance the of the wife. Yeah, yeah, right. she's the wife, and we know Dracula cares about her. That's what we know about her. If the if the son died, it'd be the same thing. Oh no, not the son, not my boy. Well, then it'd be a child dying, and that's yeah. that's like a step further. Even it's like, oh no, a kid died. That honestly, I probably would have been more upset if the kid died than if the wife died because it's like okay well they killed a kid that's that's upsetting just on on the face Uh uh-huh like i don't know who this kid is i couldn't tell you anything about him but like Uh sucks that he died yeah i mean there's good pieces of media that like kill a kid off and it's just harsh because yeah it's a kid uh we played imposter factory on the channel one time and uh that was sad. We didn't really know that kid that well. At least at first, we didn't think we did. I did. Yeah, you 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 had you had it all figured out. Play the Sigmund Corp games. That's my recommendation of the week. Anyways, uh, yeah, I ca- casting wise, there's a lot of other names here, but could you name what they did in the movie? No. no. <laughs> Zach McGowan. Do you know what he did? William Houston. Do you know what he did? No. <laughs> I'm sorry to all these uh, actors. Uh, again, like no one in this movie can be called a bad actor because the movie uh, they could be bad actors. You don't know, but the movie gave you no way of telling. There's just a character named Shkelgim. Shkelgim. It's it's the most random. It just looks like a random mashing of letters. I'm like, who who is this? Who is this? I watched this movie a week ago. It's like one of them is just like the letter F typed in over and again. They just held the finger on the F key. <laughs> Honestly, like I. Because I, I had seen this movie before we watched it this time, and I'm like, yeah, but I don't really remember a lot about it. And as we're watching, I'm like, okay, there's some cool scenes here, but, like, it's a week later, and I've forgotten so much of the movie already. Like, yeah. so much of it is just instantly forgettable. Yeah, that's, like, the the movie's biggest crime is, like, bo- like forgettability. A, a little, it's a little boring. It's not the most boring. I think part of that is just the hour and 30 minute runtime. I think that it's, like... I do get bored watching bad movies, but I might, you know, I, I have a okay attention span, like an hour, I can get through an hour and 30 minutes. It's like when you hit two hour territory where it's like, oh, come on, fucking end. Yeah. So yeah, it's not a super interesting movie most of the time, but it's, you know, they kept it short. I, I appreciate them not thinking more highly of themselves to, <laughs> to make it longer. Like, yeah, we got enough for two hours. Let's go. Uh, Honestly, like. That's why I like Venom 2 better than the first Venom, is because it's about 30 minutes shorter, and I'm like, yeah, this story only needs to be an hour and a half. You did not yeah. have two hours of material in the first Venom, and Venom 2 is like, yeah, it's an hour and a half. And it's like, okay, you had an hour and a half of material, you made that work. Yeah. Yeah, right? It, I don't know. Some I, some people complain about length a lot of movies, and I think sometimes it's completely justified, like, um, I like The Green Mile, I like The Irishman, I like Wolf on Wall Street, but they, I feel like they use their time really wisely, like, it's hard for me to point at scenes that you could cut out, probably there are, but those scenes are still scenes that are enjoyable at the very least, uh, yeah. where, like, yeah, Dracula Untold, if this movie was even ten minutes longer, I would dislike it more. <laughs> there, there, there are three hour movies that I, like, I don't feel the length at all. Uh, Scarface, Hateful Eight, I'm like, yeah, I, I could just sit down and watch these, and it's like, oh my god, it's three hours? Like, I saw Hateful Eight in theaters, and when I got out, yeah. I'm like, three hours? That that didn't feel like three hours at all. I, I think me and you are in disagreement with this one, but I actually feel that way, too. I, I agree with you on Hateful Eight, I feel that way, too, about uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, me and my dad went and saw that. That movie is like two hours and 45 minutes, I think. And when I left the theater, I was like, God, it didn't feel like that at all to me. That like that just went right by. Because mm-hmm. um, I don't know, like it, even if like not a lot is happening story wise, if you just write really good characters that keep you engaged, you can just like not notice the time going by at all. It's kind of like when you get into a long conversation with someone, and then it's like, oh shit, it's been two hours. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, Dracula Untold doesn't have any of that. <laughs> no, Dracula Untold's biggest, honestly, the the 
the biggest criticism I have of the movie is that it's completely forgettable. Yeah. Um, more main character interactions with uh, Charles Dance would have made the movie better. Uh, less focus on, you know, just keeping it to the fantasy side. And don't focus on this real thing that happened. Just do a fun vampire movie, I think, would have made it better. If you're going to tell a story like this, I think you need... I don't know. I, I a lot of people will disagree with me on this. The fantasy genre, I think, is a pretty beloved one, but I, I feel like you need. I don't. I don't think fantasy movies work most of the time, unless you can like successfully do a trilogy. Because uh, yeah. I just, I think there's normally just too much. I, I don't know. Okay. Well, even it, like it, even like war movies tend to focus on like specific parts of the war. They tend to focus on like a battle yeah, that yeah. happened, or just like a mindset of the people in the fight. You know. Um, yeah, uh, Apocalypse I, I, Now doesn't focus on the entirety of Vietnam. Yeah, I'm gonna say it depends on what type of fantasy movie you're making. Obviously something like this that's very like Lord of the Rings with huge battles and uh -huh. all this politics. Yeah, that's gonna be a problem. But I mean, on the other hand, you have something like Conan the Barbarian where it's just a guy with a sword going around killing people and it's like, yeah, that works. You can yeah. do that in a movie. Sure. <laughs> like, because it's a, it's a simple story. It's a very simple story. Like, the, it's, it's, it, it depends on where you're going with the fantasy, you know? Yeah. I think, what I guess the best way for me to put it is, like, lore-heavy movies. Yeah. Would be a better, it, that goes a fantasy so often, but, you know, like, going back to a previous Hall of Victories, it's the exact reason the last, it's not the only reason the movie doesn't work, but it's one of the biggest reasons The Last Airbender didn't work is it's taking 20 episodes and making it into a two-hour movie. That doesn't work. Yeah. It's too much information. Honestly, that's why I never watched the Warcraft movie, because I'm like, this is either going to be just heavy, heavy exposition dumps to get all the lore out, or it's going to... Like, like there's just going to be no explanation. I'm not going to understand what's happening. Yeah. Right? For <laughs> sure. I, I know World of Warcraft has an insane lore to it, and I know a movie's not going to be able to capture that. So mm -hmm. either they're going to bog it down with exposition, or they're just going to expect me to come in knowing what Warcraft is. Yeah. There are certain s steps to take when being considerate about a movie adaptation of something, you know? Like, uh, Lord of the Rings was kind of like a... Sp was su It's amazing that they pulled it off, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but not everyone's going to be able to do that. Like, you have to really have a solid plan. I, I mean, I think we have, like, look at every other Lord of the Rings movie, and you're like, yeah, they kind of, like, lightning in a bottle with that one. Yeah. It's like, the Ralph Bakshi one's interesting, but uh, it certainly has its weaknesses. And then you've got the Hobbit trilogy, and the Hobbit trilogy is not good it's really dull yeah I, I i my friend i never watched the whole thing my friend tried to get me to watch the first one with him like on a rewatch he was re there are people who are into it he was really into it by like 30 minutes and i was like ah, can we please do something else yeah mitzi's into it yeah <laughs> and i know, I know. Mitzi's gonna make me watch them and i'm like i don't want to watch them <laughs> movies Mitzi's gonna listen to this as no, they? No, they, they they probably will they probably will but like <laughs> I don't like the Hobbit movies. I'm sorry. It's not my cup of tea, but plenty of people like them. So I guess it's not like... Like, no disrespect. <laughs> uh, anything else to say about Dracula Untold? No, not really. I feel like we didn't talk a whole lot about Dracula Untold. <laughs> we got off topic a lot during this one, but I, I feel like we're just comparing it to... Like, in every aspect, we're comparing to other movies, like... It's like, you, okay, this doesn't work. Here's how it could work. Yeah. Because it's boring, that's what you said. Like, that's like... I mean, boring is... I don't even know if boring is as good of a word as forgettable. Like, you said forgettable. I think that's better, because I wasn't falling asleep during this movie. I wasn't, like, like checking the timestamp every ten seconds, but... No. I, uh, but yeah, like, what, I what mean, did I really get from this experience? I can't name a character outside of, like, four of them, and I'm not even calling them by their names. Um, well, I mean, one of those names is 
Dracula. <laughs> but it's not his name throughout the entire movie, is it? Well, uh, but his uh, his real name is Vlad the Impaler. Yeah. It's so just... It's, like, whichever way you go, it's like, yeah, that's, like, already an iconic name. Yeah. <laughs> um... Honestly, this probably came out at the wrong time, because this feels like a, a cable movie. Like, this would have a lot of success <laughs> on cable, because yeah. it's the type of thing where you're like, oh, cool, battle scene. All right, I'm changing the channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a commercial break comes on, and you're like, all right, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sitting through commercials to see more of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, this would play much better on cable. Yeah. I mean... Uh, I'll say this, like, uh, some of the effects were done decently, I feel. Not all of them, but some of them were like, yeah, okay, for the yeah. time, this is fine. Yeah. No, I, I, I they, agree. They turned into bats a lot of times, and whenever they didn't flow the screen with it, I felt like it was a cool effect. Yeah, I that really is the only effect they have in this movie. They do but... spam it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait! That's one thing I forgot to talk about with the fucking film, with these fight scenes. There were so many times where they should have just kept spamming that. It was clearly the most effective thing. But because they wanted to have sword fights in the movie and all that stuff still, they were just like, all right, like, there were so many fucking times they should just win the bat form. Like, they showed, like, the other army couldn't even stand up when he was doing that. They couldn't fucking stand up. That would have been such a fucking advantage, and he doesn't utilize it. He comes in to, like, fight the big bat, and it's like... Just immediately swarm him with bats. It'll be over. It's like it's like not wanting to spam an annoying attack in Smash Bros. because you don't want to be obnoxious. But as like if as if that like was like your entire like country's fate depended on it. <laughs> They're just like just do down B with Pikachu. Just fucking do it. And he's like, no, no, that's that's obnoxious. <laughs> so yeah, it that was a, it, it. Was a very down B with Pikachu move. Yeah. <laughs> Just, you know, bats instead of lightning. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, would you like to introduce the mummy? Yes. So the mummy is a re not only an introduction, a reintroduction to the dark universe. Uh, second, you know, seconds the uh, th three times the charm. We'll get we'll get it. We'll get it down in a few years. Um not only the second attempt at the Dark Universe, but a kind of like a reboot of the Mummy movie, too. Like, I mean, because there was, like, the really old one that you said, what, what 1930s? Yeah, 1930s. Um, and then, you know, the Brendan Fraser Mummy movies, which I've seen the first one. I like it a lot. Uh, but this was a 2017 reboot, also for the Dark Universe, directed by Alex Kurtzman, uh, who... Not a big film director, only has one other movie to his name. Um, I never even heard of it. It's called People Like Us. Uh, and it uh, he also does a lot of television directing, though, which I would well, say in terms of... He, he is part of, like, a writing team that has written, like, a lot of the Transformers movies. Yeah. Spider-Man movies. Yeah, so he has honestly, Legend of Zorro on there. He, he's kind of someone that makes sense to bring in for, uh, like, if you're trying to, like, make a cinematic universe, it's like, yeah, okay, this guy has experience writing blockbusters. Yeah, I mean, we'll the directing is... Direct too. The directing is far from the worst thing in this movie. There's actually some pretty decent, like, shot composition and, like, sets in this movie. Um, like, I think the opening scene is, like, there's some creepy imagery that works decently. Uh, but anyways, the story follows... We start off in the past where we have... Uh, what's... Uh, something like... I'm going to look up, listen to the pronunciation again. It says her name is Aminette. <laughs> and she... Uh, you know, she's the daughter... My favorite Stephen Universe character. Yeah. You know, she's the daughter of like a great feral king. Uh, what did feral I fucking say? I, why did I fucking say that? <laughs> Uh, what? You, you said feral and not pharaoh. That was it. That was the, yeah. That was the that, uh, yeah. Yeah. Me laughing at you. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, and the mother dies, but he promises that she'll be the queen once he, uh, you know, once he once he passes. But then he gets a second wife and a new kid, and that kid is up for the role, which makes her very fucking angry. <laughs> so she makes a deal. 
that with what, what's that I, I, like the background with this movie? It's like it's another thing that's done like just throughout the movie. So I forget a lot of the names of these things. What's the thing that she makes a deal with? They give her that Set. dagger that grants her like immortality. Yeah. Set the god of death. All right, Set the god of death. Uh, gives her this dagger that has like this red gem attached to it. Um, and basically it gives her all these crazy powers and immortality. Um, and she kills her father. She kills the infant daughter. She does what Gus Fring only threatened. Um, and I say infant daughter, it might be infant son, but spoilers, spoilers, (laughs) sorry. Um, now I know his daughter doesn't die. Yeah, Walter's daughter. Uh, you don't know that. You just it's just Gus didn't do okay, it. Okay, well, du- Gus didn't do it. Okay, maybe, I know maybe Gus Hank didn't did it. Do it. That uh, out. yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, how many how many times are we gonna freeze up trying to just describe this movie? But uh, so but like dirt, while she's getting her vengeance, um, you know the, the priests who are loyal to the king, you know, basically they they uh. They trap her. They got her uh, restrained, uh, and they bury her with uh, with a bunch of mercury because that's like her weakness, I guess. And she can't resurface. However, years later, we have Tom Cruise's character Nick Morton and his buddy uh, Sergeant Vale um, travel into the desert, and they uncover this with the help of a uh, love interest, a super interest in love interest that you know a lot about, named Jenny. Um, they discover this tomb, this old tomb. And uh, Nick accidentally frees the mummy, uh, which causes uh, a lot. Of, what he kind he deliberately frees the mummy. Oh, okay. Just to like, cause like he he and his buddy are like soldiers of fortune. Yeah. And the the lady wants you know the sarcophagus to like take home, but they're like, oh, there's an imminent airstrike, and so he like just sort of shoots all the chains and like takes the 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 sarcophagus with them. He, yeah, he doesn't, like, he doesn't intentionally unleash this madness onto the world, though, is basically the Okay, point. okay, um, fair enough. Yeah, so, um, basically this thing is now unleashed on the world, uh, a bunch of, what are they called, camel spiders appear, um, and Bale gets bitten, and camel spiders themselves are harmless, they even say that in the movie, but because of, I, I think it's like, it's more so her doing something to him, so he becomes possessed, basically dead <laughs> it's weird it's a weird movie yes. um so veil vale, like there's like this plane sequence and veil vale causes like the entire you know there's a fight on the plane guns are going off you're not supposed to have guns going off on this thing <laughs> and basically the plane crashes everyone dies except for jenny who's saved by nick um but then nick wakes up alive in his body bag somehow but yeah, basically, this mummy is unleashed on the world now, and Nick and Jenny have to go and try to stop it. Veil, vale, uh, demon or mummy veil, vale helps them too because he's like, I guess, now in control of his body again, despite having these powers. And then there's a whole other thing with uh, Doctor Henry Jekyll, who's uh, trying to set up the other movies in this universe. Yes. It's just a fucking mess. That's the thing with this movie. The, the Dracula and Told was such an easier movie to describe. This movie was such a fucking like it was so all over the place. It's yeah. almost two hours long. But basically, the the abridged way to describe this plot. Feel free to cut out some of the stuff I said here because I know it's taking me forever to describe it. But Nick frees uh, Aminette, and she's fu- getting her vengeance on the world, and they have to stop her. The the thing with like ghost veil because it like veil dies in the plane crash but then he keeps like popping up in inside tom cruise's head yeah it i i think they just stole that from an american werewolf in london but doesn't he like <laughs> physically that... interact with things again maybe maybe like once or twice but it best i could tell he was he was only in tom cruise's head tom cruise is the only okay. one who could see him yeah, I mean, he's the only one interacting, so I got that much at least, but, like, I mean, at the very end, he's definitely back. Yeah, but it's like, like, this is something that happened in an American werewolf in London. They just stole it from American werewolf in London. Yeah. I've never <laughs> seen that not, either, but... <laughs> yeah, which I mean, like, okay, that, like, kind of ties into Universal Monsters, but not really. 
if this were a Wolfman movie and they did that, it'd be like, okay, yeah, like, cute little reference to an American werewolf in London. This movie just, just does it. And, and like, I'm, it's not the only movie where, like, a character keeps seeing, like, a ghost of someone who died and at the beginning of the movie. But the way they interact is so similar to how it happens in an American werewolf in London. Even, yeah. like, seeing him in, like, the mirror and the fact that, like, it's his, like, decaying corpse and not, like, how he was when he was alive. Yeah. So, what do you think of this movie as a whole? Let's just talk broad statements. It's fine. It was not as much of a train wreck as I was expecting it to be. Mm -hmm. And it was also not nearly as boring as I was expecting it to be, because uh, this is a movie that, this is like the rare movie that I started watching in college and then didn't finish. I was like hanging out with some friends and we were drinking and one of them's like, oh yeah, my uncle gave me like a bunch of DVDs. Uh, oh, hey, the, the, the mummy movie's in here. Let's check this out. This will be funny. And then like 20 minutes in, we're like, nah, this is really boring. Shut this off. Honestly, like, the opening of the movie is the most boring part. Um, I actually think that there was, like, pretty cool, like, set and shot in the opening of the movie, which is just, like, the scene with, like, the crows kind of, like, she's being, like, put into uh, her sleep and the... Or, I, no, actually, I think it's when she gets her powers. Um, and, like, you have the crows, like, attached to the ceiling, like, trying to break free. I don't know. I felt like there was some, like, decent, like, creepy imagery created there which only in that scene this movie is not treated like a horror movie at all it's treated like a thriller um it's treated like a superhero movie yeah yeah kind of because they do have power he does have powers in the movie yeah um and then you got uh gender swapped imhotep attacking the the village yeah i think that uh, I, I definitely got more bored than you did watching this one. I think the most fun I had watching it was trying to find, like, the sound bites they used in the trailer that got uploaded by accident. Um, Niner Niner was definitely the same. The really funny um, Tom Cruise scream is in there, but it's not during the plane scene. It's actually later. Um, just, like, it's some scene where they're, like, walking outside at nighttime. I mean, it could have been a completely different scream. That just it's, sounds similar. It sounded exactly... I, I think I think it was the same one, because I've watched that trailer so many fucking times. <laughs> <laughs> I love that trailer. That's uh, the best thing that came from this movie, and it was completely by accident. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> um. I, I think that there were some fun, like, fun scenes. Uh, the scene with Jekyll, we, we're going to talk about it, but it brings the entire movie to a halt. Like, I, I think yeah. that's even when you were kind of agreeing that this was getting boring. Um... The, I think my favorite scene, uh, unironically, is the scene where they're, like, just driving away in the forest. Because, uh, one, like, he accidentally drives back to them and they say she's under his head. And I, I think that was kind of a neat idea. It's just, like, he unintentionally drives them back to the threat, uh, which adds a layer of, like, okay, shit. <laughs> we need to get the fuck out of here. I gotta f stay fucking focused. But also just like some of the depths in that scene were fun. Like I liked the bodies bouncing off the trees as they're trying to get into the car. And then <laughs> one of them was just like unintentionally funny when the fucking, uh, it's an ambulance. It crashes. Like it goes off a cliff. <laughs> Tom Cruise just fucking falls out of it while it's still going down. <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh. That was like the hardest laugh I got out of the movie. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, much like Dracula Untold, I would say there's, like, one or two good scenes in this movie, and then the rest of it is, like, pretty forgettable. Yeah, I think... Um, Go ahead. Except for that one specific scene, but... We'll, mm. we'll put a pin in that one and come back to it, because there's a lot to unpack there. It, I, I, I'm just going to say this. I do, um, it's, it's really close with this one, which one of these movies is going to win, but... If anything is going to make the mummy lose, it's that. Because that's like the dip. That is the key difference between this movie. <laughs> These two movies is one has 20 minutes of setting up other movies and one does not. <laughs> yes. Uh, but anyways, yeah, we, we should talk about that like last probably. <laughs> yes. 
Um, I think two things this movie has over Dracula Untold is one better presentation. I think that the shots are better. I think that the lighting is better. I think that just like, I, I just think it's like, yeah, it's a, the settings are, not all of them are more interesting. Some of them are very generic. Like you have forests, you have like just regular buildings, but I mean, yeah. you, you also have some cool tombs that these fights are happening in. You have yeah. uh, more like uh, alive and bright looking places. I would say, on the whole, this is a better-looking movie than Dracula Untold. And the other thing that this movie gets props for over Dracula Untold is, if you look at the casting, I remember who each of these characters were. <laughs> That's true. Um, Not also, all of them, but, but, a, but, but to be fair, a lot of the characters in this movie are just, like, minions, basically. Like, oh, they're... Yeah. They work well, for okay, the nice. government, or they work for they work for Jekyll, or they work for Aminette. There are five characters I think are, like, distinct enough to remember, where with Dracula Untold, it's, like, two. <laughs> I'll, I'll give them six. I, rem- I recognize, uh, I recognize Greenway, too, played by Gortney- Courtney B. Okay. Vance, but he's only I, in the beginning of the movie. I mean, yeah, fair enough. Um, he, he did stand out as a character. I just sort of meant, like, of the main cast. Like, yeah, I remember all five main characters. Yeah. Honest to God, without looking at their information, Jekyll, Vale, and Nick, I remember. And Jenny, honestly, I remembered every... Aminette was the only one I had to look up, and Greenway. Uh, those four actually just remembered their names without looking them up. Didn't, rem- didn't remember last names, like Morton or Halsey, but I remembered Nick, I remember Jenny. We did just watch this last night, to be fair. <laughs> Yeah, we have watched this more recently than Dracula Untold, but still, I feel like I could tell you things about all five of these characters. Yeah. Where in Dracula Untold, it's like, tell me about these characters, and it's like, she's Dracula's wife. This guy's his best buddy. I think I'm pointing at the right actor. Maybe not. Oh, that's the guy who tried to kill him? Okay, what about this guy? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, in fairness, I also think The Mummy has, like, bigger names attached to it. For sure. Like, Tom, Tom Cruise and Russell Crowe are more famous than anyone in Dracula Untold. Even Jake Johnson, if you've ever seen New Girl, like, he's very recognizable. I mean, that was a huge sitcom. No, like, he he's a, he's a noteworthy actor. He was in BoJack. He's yeah. Mr. Peanut Butter's accountant in BoJack. Um, got that Bojack mention in for the episode. And I mean, you got uh, Sophia, I'm gonna butcher that last name, Butella. I think that's right. And uh, Annabelle Wallace, who are both actors I have seen in things. And I, I mean, even Jake Johnson, I would say, is like an actor I have seen in things. Yeah. Uh, should we talk about their performances? Uh, sure. Let's talk about the, the acting. Um, because Tom- I mean... Let's talk about Tom Cruise. Let's talk yeah. about Tom Cruise. <laughs> I think he does what he normally does. Like there, I think that I think Tom Cruise is normally not bad. I think that it's like the he gives like a pretty like you know decent main character. Like okay, he's likable enough. He's charismatic enough. That's often a, his movies. Nothing about it. You're not going to be thinking about it the next day. Occasionally, he goes above and beyond. Like I. I do really like his performance in Rain Man. I think that character is a more notable perform. Like it's, I think it's because of the writing is better too. But I think it's like, yeah, he was the right pick for that. The character's yeah. kind of a, it's kind of working off of that douchier side of Tom Cruise, and he's really fucking good in uh, Magnolia. Oh yeah, yeah. No, Tom Cruise is a good actor, but he's one that rarely leaves an impression on me. Yeah, he, he's just sort of like, yep, okay, you were the main character. You sure were the main character. I think there's almost like, that's like one thing I'll give him this. Like, is like, there's some actors where it's like, they're the main character. I'm like kind of dreading it sometimes. It's like, (laughs) Oh, this isn't going to work. Tom Cruise. It's normally like, it'll be fine. Yeah. I mean, like you kind of need Tom Cruise to be in a movie where like the character is not really the focus. That's yeah. why he's he's so good in like the Mission Impossible movies because mm. those movies are all about the action and the the crazy story that's going on and it's like yeah you kind of need just like a solid leading man like Tom Cruise who's not gonna like draw too much attention from yeah. what's going on but who will do like all of these insane stunts. I, I'm I'm sure that one exists, but I've never seen a Tom Cruise performance where I was like, oh, that was awful. 
Like, I can't believe it. Like, I can't believe he did that. Like, I've never had that moment with Tom Cruise, but he also, like, doesn't often. Yeah, like, the Magnolia and Rain Man, those, when, when thinking of, like, characters that he's played that I actually love, those are, like, the two that are going to come to my head, and that's it. Uh, yeah, Magnolia's one, and, and I think about his character in Tropic Thunder. <laughs> Oh, I haven't it's, seen that. It's he doesn't look like himself. Like you, you wouldn't even. I didn't know it was Tom Cruise the first time I watched the movie until <laughs> it got to the end credits, and I'm like, Tom, T- Tom Cruise, T- really, <laughs> Tom Cruise? Because he's got he's got like a bald cap and he's wearing prosthetic arms. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll have to check it out eventually. That's what oh, I've, Tropic, he- I've heard about for Tropic years. Tropic Thunder is great. Yeah. Uh, that that might become a movie night pick if you haven't seen that. <laughs> yeah, um, that. I was I was gonna say if there's a bad Tom Cruise performance I've seen, it was in Cocktail. But even then, oh. I don't think I don't think he was bad in that. I just think it was a bad movie. Uh huh. Um. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. I I guess like. I, yeah, I don't know. I've never seen a bad Tom Cruise performance. I've just only seen like one or two great ones, you know? Yeah. No, um, that, that, is, that would be my takeaway from Tom Cruise. I get why people like him so much. Like, he, I think he, like I said, I think he has good charisma. I think he has, like, good screen presence. Um, he's a lunatic who does his own stunts, so it's like, hey, he cares about the craft. Uh, no, Tom Cruise loves movies. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, I, I, uh, even that new Top Gun movie, um, I think he was good in that. Like, like a, uh, as, as a human being, absolute nutcase. <laughs> as, as, like, someone in the film industry, I have a lot of respect for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, anything else to say about good old Tom Cruise? Nope, I think we said it all. Um, Sophia Butella. I think that the performance was as good as it could be. For what it was uh i don't know maybe not maybe they could have given i don't know um i kind of like the appearance of the character like i feel like they came up with a good design for her yeah uh but i did not enjoy the character at all my biggest fear watching <laughs> it is that they were about to make they were gonna be like making her sympathetic they did not go that route there was just multiple points where it felt like they were i th- i feel like they were a little bit aimless with her um like they had a good visuals attached to her character. They had like a decent, like thought out, like, you know, they had a simple enough backstory, but one that kind of worked for her, you know, it's the whole, Oh, I wanted to be King and got screwed out of it. But, um, stuff like killing the baby just feels like shock value. That's why I'm glad they didn't make her sympathetic, but yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of, uh, it was hard to form an opinion on the character. It's mainly just one that frustrated me. Yeah, no, she's just, like, like, such an underwhelming villain. <laughs> yeah. Like, to, to, to start this franchise on, it's like, yeah, uh, okay. Because, I, I mean, I, you have some of that, like, some of that flavor left over from the original Mummy. Because this is, like, fairly close to the story of the original Mummy. Granted, in that, it's Boris Karloff, who is a man. But, like, otherwise, like, it's it's a very similar story of, like, uh, you know, lost secret tomb of this character who, like, delved into forbidden knowledge back in ancient Egypt, and now they've returned from the grave with a vengeance. And... Anything anything interesting I, about her, I think, is something that is also true of Boris Karloff in his version of The Mummy. Mm-hmm. Uh, or even, like, The Mummy from the, the, the Hammer Horror remake, The Mummy. That's the thing. There's four movies called The Mummy. <laughs> <laughs> and this is far and away the worst one. I think that they either needed to, like, create a more sympathetic villain... Which, again, could not do after the killing the infant scene. But they could have also not had that. They could have just had her murder and her father in, like, a rage, like the father was an asshole. Or they just needed to make her more balls to the wall, like, evil. Like, they just needed to make her fucking nuts. And maybe that could be blamed on the villain, like, the actor. Because it's like, you know, they kind of had, like, a setup there. They kind of had her, like, sucking the life out of people. 
Literally. I feel like she, she doesn't get enough screen time to be balls to the walls evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You gotta make room for Russell Crowe. Yeah, that's a problem, too. Um, Russell Crowe is fine in this movie. Didn't need to be there. <laughs> yeah, like, I didn't have anything against the performance, necessarily. I have a lot against the writing and the presentation of, like, you you, you, you called it out when we watched the fucking veininess. That's how they're gonna make him look evil. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jenny was such a boring character. I thought she added I, so little. They tried. They tried. They gave her like a double cross, kind of like oh, there's a big reveal of who she is, and she has like a b- back and forth banter of Tom Cruise. She's not nearly as boring as the wife and Dracula Untold, but I, I, I was gonna say I disagree a little. I think she's a really boring love interest, but like when you separate her from being the love interest, I think she is like, the driving force of the plot, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just didn't care for any of the dialogue with her. Like, I felt most of her... That's fair. I felt like most of her, like, dialogue came from, like, back and forth of Tom Cruise's character, and it just... Seen it a million other places, there was nothing especially, like... I don't think the two had good chemistry at all. Uh, It's just one that I didn't think worked very well. Um, Nothing, I mean, again, nothing really against the performance. I think it's about as good as you can get with what was written, what was delivered. Uh, Just, I agree that, yeah, you're right. She does move the story along. She she serves a point, you know. She's not like a pointless character, but was not a fan. Um, And then Jake Johnson as Vale, like, I think he's a good sitcom actor. Um... You mentioned that he did, like, he voiced Peter B. Parker in Spider-Verse, and yeah, he did a good job with that. Actually, that was a good performance. I think that a lot of his, like, movie roles, I guess maybe we could argue live-action movie roles, I, I, he doesn't really do it for me. I think he works much better, and, like, with a certain tone attached. I feel like they specifically put him in this movie to add some comedy to it, um, but it's just, like, he, it's the wrong kind of comedy for a movie like this, because it just feels really out of place and weird. Mm-hmm. Um, did not care for him in this. Uh, honestly, I, I normally don't care for him when I see him in movies. On uh, New Girl, he's perfectly fine. Uh, I'm not the biggest New Girl fan, but I think he works fine. And then, yeah, Spider Verse. I loved him in Spider Verse. I thought he was completely fine in this movie. Mm-hmm. Wasn't like horrible. It wasn't like oh, it's dreadful or anything. It was just like not. It wasn't too. Wasn't too fond of it. <laughs> I guess that didn't, didn't really make me laugh kind of fell out of place to me but but his au- interactions of tom cruise were awkward but that's just me fair enough um so something that has always struck me about this movie and like that there were a lot of missteps while making this but to me like an obvious misstep was This is supposed to be a franchise based on the Universal Monster movies from the 30s, right? Mm -hmm. Because they had... Those movies crossed over with each other a number of times, right? So they they already had these characters who had a cinematic universe together before. So it's like, yeah, let's bring that back. Let's do that again. But it seems so obvious to me that they picked The Mummy... Because of the Brendan Fraser mummy in the 90s. So they were hoping to cash in on the nostalgia. Mm. For this series that's supposed to be based on movies from the 30s? Yeah. I mean, when I when I saw like the trailers for this, I wasn't even aware of like the 30s mummy movie. And I absolutely thought that's what they were doing. What's going off of the Brendan Fraser mummy movies? I think that's what most people probably thought. Yeah, mo- most people seem under the impression that this is like a remake of the the Brendan Fraser movie, which it isn't. Honestly, plot wise, it does stray a lot closer to the Universal Monster movie, despite the fact that like the the the, the Brendan Fraser mummy movie was more of an action movie, and this is more of an action movie. Mm. Honestly, maybe they should have. Been, tried to be a little closer to the the Brendan Fraser mummy. Maybe I, I mean that would that would definitely work better with like this MCU thing they're trying to do. But uh-huh. uh, at the same time, like if they were okay with straying away from what the MCU did and focus more on what you mentioned, like them actually having the films connect in the like thirties, 
yeah, they, they could have stood out. They could have maybe had, I don't know, like the best, if you want to make a cinematic universe work outside of Marvel, we already have Marvel. So the best way to go about it is to try something a little new. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Brendan Fraser, by the way. He's coming yeah. back. Hell yeah. Uh, the Whale. Uh, Darren Aronofsky. I'm gonna, I, I would have gone and seen any Darren Aronofsky movie anyways. I'm pretentious as hell. I love Darren Aronofsky. <laughs> Whale versus um, pig next episode. <laughs> Comebacks, although Nicolas Cage didn't really go anywhere. He just appeared in bad stuff for a while. I think Nick Cage's comeback was Mandy. It was it was before pig, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um But they both kind of have like they have similar vibes. Like just look at the poster for pig and whale and tell me that doesn't kind of yeah. feel <laughs> And they they're both named after animals. Yeah. Just singular um, too. That was it. I just wanted to mention that Brendan Fraser was going to be in The Whale. (laughs) So let's talk about the cinematic universe. Let's talk about the dark universe. Uh, Because Marvel is the only one who has pulled off a cinematic universe so far. At least, like, in the modern era. You know, obviously you've got, like, the old Universal monster crossover movies, and Godzilla's been doing crossovers forever, but... (laughs) I guess technically the monster movies did okay. Like it's not, they're not like widely as widely loved as Marvel movies are, but I, I feels I, all of the people I know who are a big fan of those seem to be fairly into them. Like the Kong school Island and yeah. Godzilla versus uh, King Kong where a lot of average I, movie goers were not too into them, but I have been underwhelmed by all the Godzilla entries so far, but uh, Kong skull Island, I thought was a fun little movie. I like that movie. Uh, not not amazing, but I like it. I'll defend it a little. Like I, I people shit talking. I'm like, nah, this is a fun movie. Um, it had some heart. I like John C. Riley's character in it. Honestly, I kind of wanna, I kind of wanna talk about it versus like the the, not not as like a Hollow Victories episode, but just like as of do do like a video comparing that to the the Peter Jackson King Kong movie. <laughs> Because that's like the Peter Jackson King Kong is a passion project, and that's a corporate product. But the corporate product works better. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a corporate product, a corporate product can work really well when you have like, on um, at least people. I think all you really need is people to be on the same fucking page. What I get the idea with this with this specific cinematic yeah. universe they were trying to set up is someone <laughs> had a cool idea, and then way too many people got their fucking hands on it. <laughs> Who did not agree with one another. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, like, this almost... This almost doesn't even feel like it's supposed to be the setup to this universe. Except the 20-minute scene where they go back to Jekyll's lab. And yeah. Jekyll sets up the entire dark universe. And then the movie just resumes. <laughs> and it's like... like that was the, painful. Yeah, the plot stops dead so they can introduce this universe yeah and jekyll and hyde is such an odd character to to pick as like your central guy for this because first off universal did not have a jekyll and hyde movie back in the day i mean fair enough to add him he is like a classic literature monster so yeah okay jekyll and hyde fair it makes sense for him to be in this universe I don't know why they picked him as, like, the Nick Fury that's going to unite all these guys. Because, like I said earlier, I feel like the central figure of this series should be Van Helsing. Uh, But even if you don't want to go with him, there's also Dr. Frankenstein. Mm. Dr. Frankenstein would be a good central figure. Yeah. I I don't know why they went with Jekyll and Hyde. And you kind of alluded to it, but, like, the his transformation is so fucking lame. Yeah. It's like... When he's when he's Jekyll, it just like he has like dark veins popping out of his face, and that's it. The traditional depiction of Jekyll is like he's just like a creepy, like he's a person, but he's like a hairy person with like big snarling teeth and like angry eyes. And yeah, th- this is. Go ahead. I'm looking at I, I'm looking at pictures of it right now, of like just like okay, what is he supposed to look like? Because I'm not super familiar with Jekyll and Hyde, and yeah, it's like significantly better, in like anywhere else other than that movie, fan art, uh, books, like book covers, 
uh, old movies. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really boring design for Hyde. And it's like, like, why? I don't I don't even feel like it's that cost effective. Like, you have to do CGI on the face if you just made them look different. Like, do you have the makeup department do something? I don't know. It feels like, uh, <laughs> feels like a movie where they wanted to do as much in post as possible and just get the shoots over with. Yeah. You have to earn a fucking cinematic universe, and doing shit like that just proves that you're so well, disconnected. Because I can't... That couldn't have been anyone's passion idea. That couldn't have been like, oh, I really always thought it'd be cool if uh, if Hyde had, like, a veiny face. Yeah, no. Say what you will about the Marvel Universe. There's a reason it took off as a cinematic universe, and all of the other cinematic universes have, like, petered out. I guess the DCEU is kind of still going on, but... Even then, it's really obvious Warner Brothers is trying to distance themselves from it, right? Because you've yeah. got, like, the Joker movie, which is not part of the DCEU, and, like, Shazam barely connects to it, and those are, like, the two best movies they've put out since starting this cinematic universe. I think what happened with them is they, like, jumped into the crossovers immediately, it backfired, but then some of the movies that they put out did well, so, like okay, let's just focus on these individual ideas, and if we ever want to cross over after them, maybe we can. Let's just see how they, let's just see where we're going, because they're keeping Wonder Woman going. I guess they're keeping The Flash going. God rest us all. Uh, um, well, I, and here's the thing, though, like, they put out Justice League, which is supposed to be, like, their big tentpole movie, and for the longest time, I knew, like, one person who had seen Justice League. Yeah. Right. It it did not have like the cultural impact something like the Avengers had. Right. You had to see the Avengers. Everyone was talking about the Avengers. No one was talking about Justice League until they released the Snyder Cut. Was Wonder Woman before or after? I think Wonder Woman. It, it was before Justice League. It was before okay. Justice League, but it was after Batman versus Superman. That is two characters. That got their own movie before um, Justice League. Because I'm not including Batman in that. He didn't get his own movie. He shared. Now, I, Bat Batman vs. Superman is something I think you can do pretty early in that universe. Because, like, we've seen enough depictions of Batman and Superman to sure. know who they are, to know what they're about. But uh, Justice maybe, League? Maybe it's bad to establish Batman that way. Uh, yeah, there should have been a Batman movie before Justice League. And also, like, Flash didn't have one yet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess I, Wonder Woman got hers, but I mean, even, yeah, like, Aqu Marvel had well, at least one sequel set up before uh, in Avengers, you know? Like, give us time to know these characters. You know what actually pissed me off? What? Aquaman was in so much of the promotional material for Batman v Superman. Like, you, you would see, like, Batman v Superman figures, and it's like, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman. He's not in that fucking movie. He he does not appear once in that fucking movie. <laughs> well, that's another one. Aquaman's movie wasn't out yet, but he's, like, yeah. a big part of that. Like, come on. Again, that's just so many people. It's, like, same thing with this Dark Universe. So many, Someone had an idea, and I think with uh, DC, it was probably just to do what Marvel's doing. Um, with Dark Universe, I could believe with it DC originated from a better place. With DC, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Because, like, okay, well, D DC and Marvel have always been in competition. Yeah. We gotta be in competition with them now. But too many people got their hands on the pro, like, got their hands on it, because there's probably someone, like, there are probably people there who was like, okay, yeah, let's make uh, each character gets their own movie first. And then other people were just like, I mean, the, mo the crossover movies are what people really care about, so let's just jump into those. Mm -hmm. and it's like you know they, you've, you it's just like the most basic way of missing the point plus you know it, marvel was already like deep in the mcu and they're like ah oh, shit we gotta catch up yeah it's fucking that's and that's why i feel like something like the mummy doesn't work because they're trying to catch up to marvel yeah. rather than starting small the way marvel did patience patience like none of those fucking marvel movies uh, derailed their, like, the first five Marvel movies leading up to Avengers, none of them fucking derailed themselves. They're making it clear that they're connected, 
but they're not like derailing themselves for like 10 to 20 minutes to set up another movie. Ant-Man did, but that was after Avengers. Yeah, yeah, well, Marvel, yeah, anything after, like, they, I'm saying, like, Phase 1 was done pretty yeah, phase, damn well. Phase 1 was done well, I will yeah. agree. Yeah. Yeah, nowadays it feels like everything has to be a crossover, like, there, ha- you have to have Doctor Strange in the new Spider-Man movie, you have to have Wanda in but the new I, Doctor Strange honestly, movie. Honestly, to some degree, that's just, like, the way they've written the story, right? Like, yeah. those characters no. have to be in the story because they, they're they a part of the universe. These characters yeah. know each other. You can't just ignore that. Yeah, you're not wrong. That's that's true. But they are, they, and, and honestly, you could say that they earned it, too. Because they did take yeah. their time. Uh, they, I think it depends on the movie, but yeah. 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 Um, I, I think right now they're trying to get a lot of hype of, like, multiverse shit and... Yeah. That might not work Honestly, out, but we'll see. Here's the thing. I almost see the multiverse shit as, like, a setup to going back to doing, like, individual movies. Individual superhero movies. Because it's like, oh, yeah, this takes place in another universe. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we Maybe. don't have to tie it into the MCU. Yeah. That, uh, that could, uh... And then, like, and then later just do the crossover movie, if you want. Yeah. But um, we'll see what they do. I mean, people people are bad mouth and Marvel a lot now, but I feel like that's happened a lot on and off for the last decade. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. I remember after Age of Ultron, a lot of people were fucking shit talking them, and then Infinity War came out and people loved them again. And then Guardians came out and people loved them again. Yeah, Phase Phase Two was like a bad time for the MCU. This is just the cinematic universe talk episode of Hollow Victories. <laughs> Yeah, we, we've kind of drifted off from the mummy a little. Uh, should we maybe rope it in and move on to voting? Yeah, I feel like I've said everything I need to say about the mummy. It, it definitely lost me throughout a lot of it, but it's not like, I, I, just like Dracula and told, it's not the worst thing that we've covered or anything. Yeah, no, I agree. It was not nearly as bad as I was expecting it to be. I guess I'll give you first vote. Um, I'm gonna go, I, The Mummy comes really close just because its characters stand out better and I think it's better made than Dracula Untold, but what The Mummy does to derail itself and just drag it on, I, I, I gotta say, uh, mum, the, Dracula Untold, I wasn't checking the time bar and then dreading that only 10 minutes have passed. <laughs> I, uh, wasn't like, I felt like The Mummy took forever to be over over with i was almost like falling asleep by the end of it um yeah like i i gotta give it to dracula untold just for like staying focused and uh, being shorter and i think that one scene with him talking to the vampire you know the master vampire i guess was more interesting than anything out of the two movies um so given a really cool scene to uh yeah gonna give it to dracula untold it's close yeah, I this one was closer than I was expecting it to be, because going in, I'm kind of like, nah, it's probably gonna be, like, Dracula Untold, definitely. And then after, after, as we were watching them, I'm like, okay, maybe it could be The Mummy? Uh, I would say, quality-wise, these are pretty even. I, I gave them both the same score on Letterboxd. They're but, pretty, pretty close on my list right now. Yeah, but... Like you said, the difference is Dracula Untold stands alone. The Mummy has just 20 minutes where the plot gets completely derailed to set up movies that never got made. Yeah. And it's extremely distracting. It You could argue it makes it a more interesting movie. There's more to talk about with it because of that, but mm-hmm. it, it's... It, as much as it makes for better discussion, it makes for a worse movie. So I, too, am voting Dracula Untold. Damn, I uh, thought we might finally have one where we disagree. No. <laughs> we we are against the audience on this one, although it's close. It's 42 for Dracula Untold versus 58 for The Mummy. Mm. So I think more people might just be aware of The Mummy. That's my thought. Because, like, the Garfield one, and I'm like, Garfield definitely beat Marmaduke because no one has seen Marmaduke. And I think this is a very similar situation where it's like, no one's seen Dracula Untold. Although I'm sure some people voted Dracula Untold just because yeah. they have seen The Mummy, and they're like, can't be as bad as The Mummy. 
Yeah. Yeah, I I I feel that for sure. Uh, Dracula Untold wins. Woo! Alrighty. Uh, so we have done matchups that were like most of our matchups actually are adaptations of things, even related things. We did Batman and Robin versus Catwoman, uh, and then Supergirl versus Superman four, but we've never done two adaptations of the same thing. Hmm. So next time, we got a little old versus new going on. We Next time, it will be Kirk Cameron in Left Behind the Movie versus Nicolas Cage in Left Behind. <laughs> All right, we're doing a nostalgia critic old versus new. Get ready. <laughs> Doug, Doug Walker's guest star next episode. <laughs> Yes, Doug will be joining us to discuss the two Left Behind <laughs> movies. This makes perfect sense. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm, I'm negotiating it with him right now. He's definitely going to be here. I sent him, like, a Gmail and everything. Um, all right, I'll be I'm, looking forward to that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that, because I... <laughs> I don't know how you will respond, but I find those both of those movies pretty funny. And... There is a lot to talk about because they're two very different movies. I think that Kirk Cameron and uh, Nicolas Cage are both very interesting fellows, so <laughs> that'll be fun. Uh, Just for them alone. <laughs> Gotta watch I mean, Kirk Cameron Saves Christmas. Uh, that's that's one of the ones I, I was telling you earlier. I keep coming up with like half Christmas matchups and I'm like... <laughs> What do we, what do we pair saving Christmas up with? And the obvious choice is twenty twenty five, a world enslaved by virus, <laughs> but that's not a Christmas movie. <laughs> uh, anyways, anything else to say? Uh no. Uh, happy Halloween. Yeah, happy Halloween, everyone. From my co-host Mummy Mackle, I'm Matt Presents. Have a good evening. On peace because it's spooky month. You could have said rest in peace. Fuck!